This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Our most frequent thoughts, feelings, and behaviors directly correlate with the quality of our sleep. Valeria interviews Andrea Squibb. She is a certified clinical hypnotherapist and certified CBTI clinician. She graduated with honors from the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Los Angeles, California in 2010 and received her CBTI certification via Dr. Greg D. Jacob, whose program was created and utilized at the Harvard Medical School for Insomnia. She also has a BA from Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut. It is her personal goal to help each client realign their subconscious programming so it is congruent with their conscious desires, hopes, and dreams. With the help of guided imagery, hypnotic suggestion, NLP, CBT, CBTI, EFT, brain spotting, mindfulness techniques, idiomatic response techniques, personal insight and professional experience, Andrea provides clients a safe place to be heard, free fears, reduce anxieties, weed out unwanted behavior, grow and improve. It is Andrea's mission to empower others to achieve their goals and dreams, to help people better understand themselves and the world we live in, and to expand the world by enabling individuals to find their purpose and discover their soul's unique preferences. She enjoys giving others the courage to uncover and be their true selves. She believes in working hard, taking risks, acting authentically, giving generously of herself, and never being too tired or lazy to follow the code of ethics she has created for herself. Andrea believes that we create our own destiny and that our soul's desires are guideposts to lead the way. She believes that the struggles, anxieties, and joys of life are equally important in terms of living fully and that a person's soul power can emerge out of even the most difficult times, during depression, failure, and even in times of loss. She is committed to joining you on your path through the labyrinth of life and helping you to make your journey as enjoyable and meaningful as possible. Andrea has been in practice since 2010 and is a member in good standing of the National Guild of Hypnotists, the American Hypnosis Association, and the Hypnotists Union Local No. 472. She had also worked as a consulting hypnotherapist for several mental health and addiction facilities in the Los Angeles area for the last eight years. Meet Andrea at hypnotherapyandwellness.com. Here's the interview with Andrea Squibb. In your own words, who is Andrea Squibb? Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> uh, many things, many things. I, I like to think of myself as multidimensional. Um, and I like to think of all of us, all human beings, as multifaceted, multidimensional. Um, so, you know, I am a songwriter. I love to... Um, you know, write about the things I think about and see and experience in the world and and um, connect that with music because music really moves me. Um, and I'm also a therapist and the modalities that I use are um, uh, hypnosis and guided imagery and mindfulness. Um, and there's several other modalities that I use, but they all tend to relate to the subconscious mind and um, relaxation or habit change. Um, 
and I am an animal lover. <laughs> yeah, that's <beautiful>. a lover. <laughs> I live in beautiful Topanga Canyon out here in California, but I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, and I just, you know, I love personal growth and learning. Um, I love human connection. I love people. Um, so I think that's part of what brought me to, you know, what I do today, even though I've been through many different um, um many different careers in my life or, or phases of my life, I would say, but, but this one has just definitely been the most heartwarming and rewarding, I would say. What I read on your <laughs> bio, I said that off record, about <laughs> the soul, you talk about the true self and the soul. So yeah. my question is, how would you describe what that is, Andrea, the soul? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, um, that is, that's hard to put into words, I think. And it's something that, you know, I've definitely struggled with at times, you know, what exactly is spirituality? What exactly is the soul? How do we measure it? How do we know it's there? How mm. do we connect it, <laughs> right. connect to it or analyze it? You know, so um, I think that's a, that's a difficult question. But for me, I, I like to think of it as, um, uh, you know, the truest, most authentic part of myself, if I, if I peel away all the um, cultural biases or influences that maybe have been placed upon me or that, that I've taken in from other places in my life, um, not to say that I couldn't let some of those in or, or they couldn't be in line with what I, what I authentically am, but, but just you know, shaving away maybe some of those that, that really don't suit me and trying to get to that authentic, truest version of myself. And that includes what my, I like to call them my soul preferences are. You know, I, I started out the interview talking about music. Music moves me. You know, it's something that I just feel with my whole body and my mind. And to me, that's a soul preference. That's something that, you know, I just am naturally or is for me naturally. Um, and sure, I could grow and learn to be a better musician or I could learn about different music. And so there's certainly places to grow there, but it's something that I feel was just innately part of me when I was born. Um, and so to me, that that's one of my soul preferences, one of my guideposts. Sometimes it's hard to explain why we like something or don't like something or why we even fall in love, you know, <laughs> these <True>. mysterious energies, <laughs> you know, and I feel yeah. like maybe those are connected <laughs> to the soul. And um, so uh, I try to help people um, discover that for themselves if they're having trouble um, uh, and difficulty. I love that. They you actually integrate that in your work, mm. those spiritual ideas or concepts that's hard to explain, right, Andrea, to put into yeah. words. And I, I think people, just to continue a little bit on that, you know, it's a little, it's hard to know um, if you're not going to be part of a religion or, you know, maybe you are, but you're still feeling the need for something else, or maybe it's the religion is not sufficing, you know, how do you still be spiritual? And what does that mean? I think that's an interesting question. And I'm not going to say I have the answer, but <laughs> everybody has maybe their own answer. And I, you know, like to help people find that as well. With that in mind, when you speak of music, I mean, it's something that really touches us at a deeper mm. level. Yeah, I have felt, I mean, so many of us human beings have felt that connection with music. What is the spiritual in a sense of a remembrance when it comes to music? How does it touch you? Mm. Well, um, I, it's definitely something that I physically feel and can, you know, bring up emotion for me. Um, you know, I went to a concert. Um, it was an open air concert. And um, there was a, a band that was um, a lot of guitar harmony and a lot of vocal harmony. And, you know, I didn't expect this particular band to make me cry, but it was something about the way the harmonies connected and 
the I the tones and the warm feeling it gave my chest, my stomach. I you know I can't really put it into words other than it just made me feel. I mean, maybe that's the feeling of love or a feeling of connectedness, or maybe it's a soul remembrance. I don't know. Um, but that kind of thing speaks, to, you know, for me to what you're you're asking or talking about. How do you define health? What is to be healthy from your perspective, Andrea? Mm, um, well, I think, you know, in the Western world, we always right away think of physical health. Um, you know, am I mobile? You know, or is my blood count in the right place? <laughs> yes. You know, my sugar levels hmm. uh, correct? Um, you know, am I breathing easily? Um, but health, I think, should also include um, other aspects of the self. You know, um, are my personal needs met? Um, you know, do I have connection with others? Um, am I mentally well and healthy? Uh, you know, am I stressed and anxious? Am I um, unable to connect with my creative or imaginative self? Or um, there's so many mental health issues that I think belong um, in that this conversation about being healthy and well and being yeah. being whole, mm. you know, coming to a place where we have a, a whole healthy person, um, you know, a, a, are we able to explore and have time for adventures? Or, mm, you know, are we able to yeah. relax? I mean, <laughs> yes. you know, um, <laughs> are we connected to our soul preferences or our, our authentic self? Or are we, are we kind of living somebody else's life? Or, you know, to me, that would be a part of being whole as well and healthy. That resonates true to me, of course the mind tends to ask, you know, what does it look like to be healthy from that perspective? <laughs> oh, would be something like, you know, always being happy and at peace, or there is also space for anxiety, for fears. Yeah, well, I think that's that's very interesting. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I think life is always going to have its ups and downs. And perhaps <clears throat> that's part of the the purpose of, a, of the human experience is to experience all the aspects of life, you know, not just the happy days and the up moments, but also what it means to be sad and to grieve or to uh, be fearful. I mean, I, I think I, I like to think that that is part of our purpose here on Earth to have a full human experience, a full range of emotions. And we can't do that if we're just always happy ah, <laughs> and everything's so always true. going well. And, and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to build strength of character or uh, tolerance for things if everything's always going smoothly in our lives. So to me, being healthy would include, um, and, uh, you know, would include being able to tolerate and manage some of the difficult times as well. Um, being able to find the resources that you need and the support. And um, that would be a part of being healthy and well, as well as happy and peaceful. Um, hope, you know, it'd be nice if we could be a little more <laughs> skewed towards the happy and okay. peaceful. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, I'm thinking it's a very individual question too, which is why, you know, hypnosis can be uh, helpful because it can allow someone to connect more deeply with themselves and perhaps use, you know, once we answer some of those questions, like what would healthy look like to you, we could visualize um, or allow that person to visualize what that would look like in the future for them and get the subconscious mind to start to go in that direction to help them achieve that, which is a yeah, beautiful part of, hypnosis and hypnotherapy. It sounds very much like, and I, I do talk to a um, hypnotherapist. Ooh. We had, I think, seven conversations so far. Oh, and wow. She has been educating me a lot on it. And I'm very curious about it. I wanted to try even. I never yeah. tried because, yeah, she keeps telling me that's so powerful. <laughs> 
Is there anything to be cautious about when it comes to hypnotherapy and hypnosis? Hmm. Um, you know, in a big broad brush answer, I would say no, no, not really. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if you are someone who experiences psychosis or mania mm. at times, mm. then it may not be the best choice for you. Um, you know, you may want to consult, uh, or I should say you should really definitely consult with your, you know, a psychiatrist first and see if, you know, if that's a good choice for you. But, um, other than that, I, I think it's a very gentle, natural approach. You know, it's something we go in and out of on our own every day, hypnosis, that hypnotic state. And, um, the difference when you're working with a hypnotherapist is just that they are, trying to help you do that, which you do naturally on demand. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a little harder because then there's another person there that yeah. maybe you don't know that well, and it's a little strange and you've never really thought about it that way, you know? So, so it's, it's, I don't really feel, you know, you can't get stuck in hypnosis and um, there's really no danger to it in my mind. Um, you're not going to be, doing anything that you don't, um, you know, believe in or that anything that's against your morals or values, you're going to know exactly what's happening the whole time, you know, and, and you may have already said this, uh, you know, on some of your other uh, podcasts, but, or interviews, but, um, you know, it's, it, the movie industry has really done us a, a disservice mm. in that a lot of what we see is very exaggerated in the movies and it's not, not realistic, especially to, you know, therapeutic hypnosis. Oh, wow. It's uh, interesting you say that because I never actually watched any movies. Oh, okay. Had, really, there are some out there. Oh, yes. Had... There's a, the most recent one I can think of is, it was a couple of years ago. It's called Get Out, um, G-E-T-O-U-T. And uh, yeah, it's, that's very unrealistic. Oh, okay. It's got a little bit of a horror aspect to oh, it, a thriller yeah. kind of horror horror aspect, and uh, yeah, f like you know, good movie, good acting, but the whole part about hypnosis is very inaccurate. Yeah, so that's good to know. <laughs> Heads that's up here for anyone. I have, <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of young clients that come to me like, "Is it going to be like Get Out?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> uh, that's really uh, yeah. You see, yeah, you're right. The movie industry, yeah. <laughs> there's so much we can learn from movies, but then there's right. the other side. Like everything, life, as you said, beautifully said about life is everything. Right? Mm. We are here to experience everything, and to me, it seems like it's a matter of awareness, isn't it, Andrea? Mm -hmm. of yeah, kind of seeing the options we have in making the decision to go one way instead of the other. Right. How do you apply mindfulness to what mm -hmm. you do? Oh, good, good question. Um, well, you know, this this sort of ties into what you were just talking about with awareness. Um, to me, mindfulness is the practice of being um 100% aware or 100% in tune with what's happening in the present moment, whatever it is that you're doing. So even if you're just washing the dishes, you know, you're, you're really taking in every aspect of that. You're using your five senses to be aware of the scent of the soap and the warm water washing over your hands and, you know, the little soap bubbles and the way that looks and uh, the, the, all the feelings and um, sensations, the sound of the water. Um, and then it's an awareness of thought as well. So really being able to be the observer of what's happening in the moment, um, which naturally brings you more into the present because, you know, we're spending so much of our life in the past, thinking about the past, ruminating about the past or the future, strategizing or worrying and, you know, planning. And we really are so <laughs> often not at present and we're missing out if we are not present because in the present is where life is happening. That's where we have the most control. That's where, you know, we might really miss out on an opportunity or um, an intuition or an inspiration or just something beautiful that we see could see, um, you know, so often 
um, our negative thoughts and emotions are right next to a really positive one or joyful one. And if we're not present, we could just gloss over that or miss it. And so I use uh, that in my um, work just to help to get people um, more into that present place. You know, maybe we just start out with doing it in our session for five minutes. And then maybe I have them imagine doing it in the future for another five minutes every day, you know, maybe just while they're going to get the mail or, or taking a shower or washing those dishes, you know, and, and visualize themselves doing it and then actually starting to incorporate that. Um, and in that way, we can, we usually become happier and feel more empowered and more in control. Yeah, so true. The present moment, that's uh, wow, it's such a powerful practice. We don't get to kind of experience that too often. And I, just something came to me because we're talking about hypnotherapy, being hypnotized. Yeah. <laughs> when I think about being in the present moment, yeah, being present with what is present, I noticed something interesting in relationships, like people around me, my family members, my husband, my mother-in-law, that sometimes kind of get almost like hypnotized by them in a uh, sense of um, I really wanted to say no to something, but then I look into their eyes and it uh, seems like they want me to say yes and then I say yes to them. <laughs> so that's kind of... That's so true. Right? You're right. You're really picking up on their energy when you're more present. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very true. There's a lot of undercurrent, even when people aren't actually saying anything, there's yeah. always an undercurrent of emotion happening and messaging going on. I, and uh, which, yes, I completely agree that we can become hypnotized by people. I mean, that's really what falling in love is uh, at, least yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Yeah, falling in love. Wow, that that's yeah. what a hypnosis that is. Yeah, <laughs> <I know. exactly. laughs> we think completely different, act completely different. Not completely, <laughs> but very different. <laughs> so I wonder, if, is that being in the moment? Andrea, I'm just curious to know when mm -hmm. we kind of lose ourselves in the moment. I'm, I actually meant to say no to something that my husband asked me to do. Mm. But then when I looked at him into his eyes in the moment, <laughs> my mind changed. So my decision just changed. And I, <laughs> and I wonder why, like what happened? Like, like I have lost control of what I really wanted wow. to do. Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you were present to what he was feeling and his, uh, you know, um, intentions or his um, desires, you know, you were, you were present to that. Um, perhaps you lost yourself, your own intentions or your mm -hmm. own um, agenda, agenda <laughs> yeah. in that moment. but who's to say whether that's a good thing or bad, you know, right. that would take a lot more um, yeah. conversation and, Good point. and uh, Socratic <laughs> questioning. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you find that you're doing that all the time and you're not happy with those choices afterward, then, then I think that would be something to, to, um, yeah, to talk about or to explore maybe with a therapist or someone, mm, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think that would just take a little more exploration there. That makes sense. If I'm not happy with the decisions that I, I just made, the change that was made, yeah. then, yeah, it's not the case. There's something that I really follow, uh, love and kindness. Mm. This is my blueprint. It's almost like the path. So if I can make somebody happy in the moment, what in however, however it is, then it's okay. You know, I can drop whatever something in me wanted to do. Yeah. Um, for myself. <laughs> Although yeah, I do believe in self-love. <laughs> right. That's beautiful. And then, right. You have to consider your own self as well. And um, the other thing that was coming to my mind is, is just, you know, healthy boundaries. And, uh, you know, if you're really working on setting some healthy boundaries, so you don't lose yourself um, or you don't become, you know, codependent or in a codependent relationship, then, then that's, that's a different thing. But uh if it's in line with, with what you're um, talking about and your, your soul preferences or your blueprint, then I think makes sense. Sounds like. 
So I do have very bad um, boundaries. My boundaries are not established yet. I have a hard time saying no. So, uh-huh. and I wonder if I'm just using that as an excuse, those belief systems, you know, oh, we know I believe in love and kindness. I'll say yes mm-hmm. every time. <laughs> because sometimes we do that, my right, Andrea, this yes. belief systems, that that's what they're there for. Right. But it's not hurting me. So I'm okay. <laughs> as long as it's not hurting. <laughs> so that's fine. Going back to what you do. So you are a clinical hypnotherapist and CBTI clinician which yes. I did know about it. So talk to me for a moment about CBTI, what that is. Sure. Um, so that is a cognitive behavioral therapy for specifically for insomnia because um, we do have just the cognitive behavioral therapy that exists on its own as a um, therapy modality and you, you know, for all types of different things, but this is particularly for insomnia. And so it's, it's really helping people to identify and replace the thoughts or the cognitions and the behaviors that cause or worsen their sleep problems. Um, and so replacing those with habits and thoughts that actually promote good sleep. And um, luckily or fortunately, Unlike sleeping pills, CBTI as a therapy really gets to the root of the sleep issue and the cause so that, you know, you can deal with the root cause and uh, prepare for that in the future or maintain, you know, the gains you make. Um, If you never get to the root cause, it's going to be difficult. So true. That's with all, with everything. Right. Yeah, Andrea, you might get some of... benefit. You're right. You might get some short term benefit, but then you may, you know, relapse or find yourself going backwards and not knowing why and have to search for, you know, another pill or alternative. <laughs> um, yeah, that is. Uh, um, did I have insomnia before? I think I did when I was going through anxiety, uh, yeah. divorce, and all that. I remember. Mm, wow. That's very the, common. Yeah, yeah, right. In difficult times. And yes. that sounds really wonderful to me because I know how powerful hypnotherapy is in mindfulness yes. practices, of course, and you integrate them. So that sounds really, really good. So I'd love to know more and, and to explore more the work you do with um, helping others to sleep better or to overcome insomnia. And mm-hmm. I have here some blog posts that I have read. There's one that it's titled, Why is sleep so imperative and how much sleep do we need? Mm. That's a big one. It's yeah. a great question. So I would love to hear from you how important it is and how much sleep do we really need? Well, that's a, Yeah, that's a good question. Um, So, you know, I think that it does depend on what age range you're in. Um, You know, little teeny tiny babies need a lot of sleep. Yeah, true. (laughs) And and as we get, um, you know, into the the teenage years, um, there's a tendency to once again sleep more, um, you know, maybe as much as 10 hours. Um, But for the majority of the population, let's say between, um, well, I'm going to say between 23 and maybe 55. And these are just sort of, um, uh, a range. Um, we need, you know, about seven hours of sleep is the, um, the average. Now you could still be an outlier and need, you know, only six, or you could be someone who might happen to need, nine or 10 based on your chemical or um, genetic makeup, but the average is seven. And interestingly, they've shown through research that um, seven hours of sleep per night equates to the group of people that live the longest. Um, So, and a lot of us have thought for a long time that it was eight hours of sleep. You know, I feel like that's that's a number that's really been talked about for a long time. And so sometimes helping people understand that, you know, eight isn't as necessary as they might have thought, you know, that seven is seems to be based on quite a bit of research, the the um, the amount you need uh, to have optimal mood state um, and, you know, uh, functioning, health and well-being. 
Um, now, anyone who's getting less than five, five and a half hours is not getting their core sleep. So that definitely becomes problematic. You really need that core sleep to get the correct amount of deep sleep and your dream sleep, which is also the second most important sleep um, phase. So, you know, if you're not getting that sleep, that core sleep, you definitely want to, you know, work on that. Um, as we get older, you know, I don't know, there's not an exact number, but let's just say over 55 into our 60s, 65, 70, we start to need less sleep. So often seniors might only get six hours a night and that seems to be okay. And, you know, maybe they can nap a few times in the day, collect a little bit more sleep or add up to six hours totals and that that is still okay. So it does depend on the, you know, um, phase of life you're in. You also mentioned some of the signs when we don't get enough sleep and when we do get enough sleep, what happens. <laughs> and that's how I go, actually, myself. That's how I know. I don't drink coffee or don't take any caffeine. Yeah. Because I want to know how my body works, like, energetically and its own. I don't mm. want to add anything. But I know a lot of people do that. Well, you know, the um, one of the biggest um, indicators is somebody's mood you know, that's really what's going to be affected if you don't get your optimal sleep. Your mm. your mood is, you know, people talk about waking up on the wrong side of the bed, yeah. being irritable, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's really, really yeah. what's going to be the, the um, one of the signs, um, you know, nodding off in a meeting, of course, would be a big sign. Or um, if you happen to be waiting at a street, uh, you know, a light in your car mm. and... Yeah. <laughs> falling asleep that's not a good sign oh wow yeah not, <laughs> so those could be, be some of the some of the indicators that you're really really getting diminished sleep but usually if it's just you know in that six six and a half hours five and a half hours you're, you're probably more going to be your mood and some of that can be changed by attitude um you know, interestingly, like think about those nights where you've stayed up really late and had a wonderful night out dancing or on an amazing date or at a wonderful party with friends, you know, and you don't get a lot of sleep. The next morning you wake up and you're kind of still in that glow of the evening and, and it doesn't affect you quite as much. Or if you're paid to stay up late for some job or something, you're going to have a different attitude. And so that's part of the, you know, changing some of the cognitions and thoughts related to sleep as well. Um, but of course, you know, there could be all kinds of other signs, you know, dizziness, um, uh, overheating, um, sleeping during the day. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people will start to do behaviors that are actually self-sabotaging when they're not getting enough sleep. For instance, they might start drinking a lot of coffee or more coffee or later in the day, you know, they might stop going to the gym because they're too tired or, you know, fatigued or they want to take that nap. They might start napping during the day. And all these things are actually making the it worse, making the sleep drive lower so that when they actually go to go to bed, go to go to sleep, it's harder. So this is some of what I teach in my course as well. So you offer 10 hypnosis recordings mm -hmm. or hypnosis recordings uh, throughout your website and also the course. So talk to me for a moment about the course that you offer, Andrea, the six weeks to better sleep. Yeah. So um, it's a course that is including um, uh, hypnotic suggestion, education on hypnosis, which is really the bridge to sleep. Um, the mindfulness, which we've talked about, relaxation techniques, and um, the CBTI, which is the changing the thoughts and behaviors that are going to promote good sleep. So that's all included in the course. And I do um, have recordings that go with each section. I think there's about seven recordings in total. Actually, you know what? I think there may be 10 now that I'm thinking about it. But, you know, in the beginning, we start out talking about just understanding sleep, how it works, what the mechanisms are, um, beginning to um, learn about some of those negative and positive sleep thoughts, 
recording your sleep. And then we get into restructuring your thoughts. And um, if you are currently taking medication, um, we begin to taper off some of that and do some sleep scheduling, um, which is, again, changing the behaviors around sleep. Uh, I, a lot of people who are suffering from insomnia, not everybody, but a lot of people end up spending too much time in bed, uh, which is starting to make the association with the bed a negative one. Instead of it being like a place where you sleep and comfortable and a happy place, it's yeah. starting to become this really frustrating, stressful place where you don't sleep. So we need to start to change those associations. Um, and, you know, we're progressing um, or we're, we're throughout the course being mindful of the gains you're making, pointing them out providing more education and all of those, you know, wonderful tools. Some of them are physical relaxation tools. Some of them are mental relaxation tools. Um, and I just feel like six weeks is kind of needed because there's so much information and it does take a little while to um, get the subconscious mind on board with this. Um, but that being some, said, some people really start to see significant benefits within just the first couple weeks. Yeah, I can see that because that's how effective it is. I listened to one of your recordings and that was just like, yeah, this is it. It relaxes. Even if I was not thinking about sleeping, it was very yeah. relaxing. Just right. To and to and that's so important to, you know, know how to do for yourself during the day as well as at night, you know. Just having those little moments you can carve out to to escape for five minutes or 20 minutes, kind of like a reset. Yeah, right, right. That pause. Thank you so much for doing what you do. It's such a beautiful work to oh, my help pleasure. others to relax, which has, is the foundation <laughs> for healing. It really Relaxation. is. Is there such a thing as morning people and night people? Yeah, there is. <laughs> yes, there really, there really are. Um you know, we probably heard that old adage or, or phrase, uh, the the uh, night owl and the yeah, yes. <laughs> morning wren or, you know, which one are you? Yeah. But yes, there, there is yeah. some variation in people's sleep cycles for sure. Um, and, and that is something that you, you know, you want to be aware of and, and work with your own sleep cycles. Um, you know, if, if, you can work around them socially or career-wise, work-wise. That is always the best instead of trying to change your natural sleep drive. So that is something else to, yeah, to be aware of and that's included in the, the course. Mm, wonderful. And I'm glad you said that too, because that has been my case. I had oh, really? to change yeah, my lifestyle because I'm not a morning person. Mm. And I wonder if there are more of us, I mean, night people, because I usually go, <laughs> go to bed at one in the morning. <laughs> I can't do it before. It's interesting because I, I find sometimes my clients come and they, they have, they're paired up with a partner who has an opposite yeah, you know, right. um, sleep cycle just naturally. And they're trying right. to force themselves mm. into the partner's yes. sleep cycle or vice versa. The partner's trying to, you know, make them, well, you must come to bed with me now. You yeah, know? And, right. And you, you really right. have to, you know, maybe... Uh, set a boundary there or mm, <laughs> let the, yeah. the partner know, Hey, uh, this isn't going to work for me. Maybe <laughs> not everybody, <laughs> or, you know, yeah. because yes, I mean, we, we definitely do. And I don't know, I don't know any statistics that are out there. It's an interesting question that, uh, I'd love to explore, but I, um, yeah, I don't know if there's more night people or more morning people. Yeah. Um, I think about that because most people around me, they're morning people. They are not ah. like me. So that's why I have met some of them, but not too many. So that makes me wonder. Right. And that's the worst thing you can do is go to bed when you don't feel tired or you're not. Your sleep drive isn't primed for sleep because, again, you're starting to, you know, reinforce or associate the bed as a stressful, negative place where you don't sleep. And then there is um, so many blog posts. Do you have a blog post about that, actually? It's a question. It's titled, Is Your Significant Other Disrupting Your Sleep Cycle? 
Mm-hmm, so that's exactly. exactly what we're talking about, kind yes. of. Yes. <laughs> and then there's something else that caught my attention. Yeah, here. Remedies for insomnia related to menopause. Mm. Because a lot of women go through, I mean, all of us women go through for this. Sure. So yes. I love the way you say, I mean, you give some remedies there, of course, some suggestions. But then you said something that really caught my attention. You said embracing and accepting menopause as a natural progression of life. I mean, in the end, that's really what comes down yes. to Embracing and accepting menopause is a natural progression of life. Beautifully said, and you said that earlier today as well, when we mm-hmm. talked about uh, life itself and destinations for this and that health and happiness. Yeah. So that really resonates with me because a lot of times we try to fight, like sleeping, for example. Right. You know, we fight that. We fight so much. And then in the end, all we need to do really is to relax and let it be. Let it go. Yeah, I, I, it's so true. Especially, it's interesting with with sleep because for many, many things, you could say that the harder you try or the more you work at something, the better you will become. Mm, yeah. You know, the more the more yeah. you will master it. And, right. Right. But it's really not true for sleep. Um, you almost have to. You just have to stop trying. Um, in order, because the harder you try with sleep, the more it backfires, the harder it is to fall asleep, the more stressful you get, the more you get into your fight, flight, or freeze um, state. And that that's a very wakeful state where all kinds of things are happening in the body that go against sleep. So, and I, I find that to be true with, you know, uh, many things in life, as you were uh, saying as well, you know, the acceptance is such a higher vibration than than um, rejecting something or denying it, resisting it. And um, it doesn't mean that we can't improve or grow from that place or that we don't want something different, but we really need to start with acceptance and build from there. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I don't know if we have a chance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what they say, what we resist persists. Yes, right. Uh, I find that to be true, very much yeah, true. Yeah, <laughs> but it just keeps us in such a, you know, stressful state, that lower vibration, you know. Before I ask you my final questions, the ending questions, I did watch also a video that you um, made. It's about the stages leading to sleep and how oh, to yeah. better transition. I love that. Uh, mm. And I would love for you to talk about that, those stages yeah, if you can. Yeah, I think that's, that's really a helpful thing to know. And um, sometimes just applying this to your sleep habits can be enough to, to get you going in a good direction. So we have... Um, three stages that lead up to sleep. The first is the thinking stage where we're really thinking about, I call it daytime (laughs) thinking. (laughs) You know, you you might be thinking about, oh, you know, what I have to do tomorrow or or, why did that person say that to me today? Or wasn't that funny when so-and-so did whatever? And, you know, I even sometimes catch myself still thinking about a TV show I was just watching, (laughs) you know, about the characters in it or something and the plot. But but that's the thinking stage. Um, and the next stage is it's a fantasy or imagination. And this is where, you know, when we're naturally going to sleep on our own, um, we go through these stages and sometimes we don't even realize it. Sometimes they're very brief. Sometimes they're a little bit longer, but this is where your mind is starting to move towards more creative and imaginative thoughts. And some of those might even turn out to be dreams. Um, but it's just, you know, maybe you're just thinking about something that's relaxing or a relaxing image or color, or, um, maybe you're starting to have a little active dream or active imagination. (laughs) Um, and from there you go into the hypnotic stage or the hypnoidal stage. Um, and that's when you're um, muscles are really starting to, to turn off for the night so that you don't sleepwalk. You might get little muscle twitches. Um, your brain waves are slowing down and your breath is deepening. Your body's cooling a little bit. Different hormones are released. Um, and 
from there, if you can get to that point, usually you'll just transition nicely into sleep. Um, so most people get stuck in the thinking stage. And if we can begin to help them or help ourselves get into that next stage, the fantasy hip, um, imagination, then, you know, we're a lot closer to sleep. It might just happen more naturally. So, you know, I always recommend um, once you recognize you're still in the thinking phase, you know, and that could be a while before you even recognize it. Even me, sometimes I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm still, still thinking. No wonder <laughs> yeah. I'm not asleep. No. <laughs> yeah. so that, but once you recognize it, then you just say to yourself, okay, yeah. I can think about that tomorrow. Sometimes yeah. I tell people, you know, write a little to-do list if you're worried about forgetting something and just put it next to your bed so you know it's there in the morning if that's bothering you. But once you do that, you have to say, okay, I can think about these things tomorrow. I need to get my sleep. Um, uh, so not much can be solved in the middle of the night yeah. anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then it's good to go to bed with maybe a couple uh, fantasies or imaginations you could begin to think about. And they could be as simple as just a relaxing moment that you remember, you know. For me, I, I one of mine is this, this day when I was 12 years old on the East Coast, just laying sort of on this railroad tie, looking up at the sky it was bright blue and these beautiful colored leaves were just floating down from the sky, you know, different fall leaves. And I was just kind of watching them and hearing my dog playing over to the side in the yard. And, and it was just very peaceful, that brisk kind of cool air. And so that's an example of just a really nice memory you could go to or you know something more fantastical could be fun like what would it be like to be my favorite character in my favorite book or in a tv show or you know what would it like to be like to um don't laugh at me but i always use this one where i'm i think her name is elsa in uh frozen she's you know, I pretend I'm her and I'm skating down <laughs> this uh, hallway made out of ice and with ice skates. And I've got these beautiful furs and I'm looking at my frozen chandeliers and sculptures. And, and you know, I just imagine that from my own perspective. And it, it connects me to my creativity imagination, which signals my brain, oh, she wants to go to sleep now, you know. And then it just naturally happens from there. I love the way you say that about creativity, because yeah. when I think about the soul, the spirit of the soul, that's what I think mm. about. Oh, yes. Creativity. That's a place, a space to create. Yeah. Huh. And I love to meditate before going to bed. It helps me mm. a lot kind of to get into this state of imaginative state. Yes. Well, you're probably doing a lot of what I've just mentioned, you know. I, and the other the other way you could do, and this may be some of what you're doing as well, is is you can, instead of going the mental route, mm. you can also encourage your body physically to go through those stages, or you could combine and do both. So you could begin to slow your breath down. You could begin to um, meditation helps to slow down the brain waves. Uh, so you could work from a more physical angle as well. Interesting. What caught my attention too is that when you talked about sleepwalk, so the body kind oh, of yeah. signals the muscles to relax so we don't sleepwalk. Exactly. Or punch our partner. <laughs> right? That doesn't sound too good. But it happens, right. Andrea, uh, oh, the phenomenon of sleepwalk. It does. Ah. Yes. The, you know, the opposite of sleepwalking is because sleepwalking is where your, your muscles have not shut off properly, but your brain is asleep. So we also get sleep paralysis where our um, mind is awake, but our body's still asleep. And that is also very scary, although not as dangerous as sleepwalking. So there's a disconnect. Yes. Right, Andrea, that's what a, it, it the transition like. is not working um, as smoothly as, uh, you know, we would like there. Right. Yeah. But that this is a different conversation, isn't it? <laughs> a different episode <laughs> to talk about sleepwalk and all these yes. other things. But thank you so much yeah, for being you, for doing what you do. It's just beautiful the way you express to what you do with using words and communicating the message. Besides knowledge coming from knowledge, of course, and experience, it's, it's very relaxing. It's almost like mm. it feels like you're already 
kind of carrying on a session, a hypnotherapy session. Oh, good. Yeah, it got me very <laughs> relaxed to hear for a moment. <laughs> yes, uh, the way you speak. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> uh, I have a few more questions. Let me see which ones. I'll ask you this one. What is another word for life, Andrea? Oh, another word for life. Wow. Hmm experience um yeah I that's a tough one another word for life yeah I would say experience adventure that's what comes to my mind I'm just going to go with my subconscious on that one mm, yes interesting that you say that because my next and last question has to do with that what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body before they die Mm, that's a very cool question. Uh, what three experiences? Well, I think the first one that's coming to my mind is to uh, feel love and to be able to give love. Um, I don't know if I get to count that as one or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big but, one. But yes, to, to know what it's like to really feel loved, uh, even if it's just brief. Um, and, and it can, you know, I'm thinking it can come from many different places. Um, but also to be able to know what it's like to, to love as well. Um, and that could include, you know, love yourself or to, you know, feel love from yourself. I, I would like to include that in there as well. Um, what else? I do think challenge um uh some kind of obstacle or challenge that um has caused i mean the reason i'm saying this is because i do believe that challenge and obstacles strengthen us and are um a source of uh, learning and growth so I would hope that everyone has at least one challenge that they face in their life that is meaningful to them. And, um, well, God, I mean, I would love to find purpose in life myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would wish that for others. Um, and, you know, meaning or purpose. And I, I don't mean that I haven't found that necessarily, but, but um, and I, th I think, as I mentioned earlier, just, one thing I like to tell myself is that just living my life as a human being and then experiencing as many emotions and experiences as I can, that that is a purpose in itself. Even if I don't understand everything or the whole <laughs> world and how it works, you know, I like to think of that. So yeah, I would, I, I would say that as well. Um, a sense of purpose, a sense of connection through love and, um, and, and some type of obstacle. I love them all. They all make sense to me, resonates true. I love your wisdom, Andrea. Thank oh, you. Well, I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> that's that's They're beautiful. Very good yeah. questions. I couldn't have prepared for those unless I'd known what they were. So. Ah, good that you didn't prepare. That's exactly the intention. <laughs> uh, in the moment, responses um, yes. yeah, coming from that place of knowing. Thank you so much again for your presence here today, for what you do again and how you do it, for being you exactly the way you are and thank you for sharing your beautiful timeless wisdom with all of mm. us and before we say goodbye where can we find more information about you your work services and future projects oh um good yes so my company is called hypnotherapy and wellness and uh that is the website hypnotherapyandwellness.com there's lots of information there and uh, from that website, you can also um, be connected to my YouTube channel, which is there, or the course information, um, the blog posts are all there. So that's really kind of the central place to connect with me. Um, I do have Instagram and Facebook pages and all of that as well, but um Hypnotherapy and Wellness, Andrea Squibb. That's really the the go-to. 
Yes, and I'll have that link on your podcast profile yes. too. Yes, oh great, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much again, Andrea, and we'll talk soon. My pleasure. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Andrea Squibb and her work, please visit hypnotherapyandwellness.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.